Hi, Barbara. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for helping us out today. Of course. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, this. it's um, it's such a great um, skill to have to be able to check out all those mappers. And I think conservation <laughs> commissions uh, need a little extra help with that. So we're glad to yeah. have you. I'm excited to go through it all. I'm in a different conference space right now, so I'm just going to work on like adjusting my yep. situation while we talk. You can check your share screen <laughs> or whatever you need. Um, I so I'm I'm set up to do almost all of these live. Okay, I have everything situated, and, and I know there's some risk involved with that, but mm -hmm. you know I'm not. I don't want to jinx it, but. Hey, it's worth it. Worth a try. It should sure. work. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I know. Um, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would go for it. And and if we have to backtrack a lot, or you know. Yeah, we'll I think my slides that I have prepared, I could still, you know, worst case scenario, I'll just work through those. It might be yep. a little more boring than I would want it to be, but. Yeah, definitely seeing um, it live is very helpful. And I did send. Um, when I sent the, the reminder to uh, register for this program, I did send a lot of um, different mappers that people could check out before the program. Okay. And, uh, some people did, I think not everybody did, but uh, a few, I did get a response that I sent too much information <laughs> to try oh, okay. to get. So I was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'll cut back on the next one. So um so that that's what I was thinking too. Um, I have, you know, I have a certain order laid out, and I'm going to go through them through them all. But it is a lot. It's going to it might yeah. be kind of overwhelming for some people. Yeah, but and I think in in my um, my description, I think I only mentioned wetland permit planning, one stop, and the aquatic restoration mapper. So okay, you don't have don't feel, you know what. Again, I can always send the links to the rest of those programs, or you can just mention them, but don't don't feel like you have to cover all of them because okay. Sandy, um, <clears throat> Sandy Crystal sent a great list of, I want to say there's like five or six. I mean, then there's, you know, we haven't even talked about Granite, which is another really yeah. nice user-friendly option. Is there a chat feature in the meeting? Yes. So um what I when I introduce you and when I welcome everybody, I'll let them know that um, it it will probably be a large group. So using the chat box will be the best option for asking questions, I think. And I'm happy to monitor that chat box and then, you know, relay quest questions to you or, you know, because I know it's awfully hard to kind of look at the chat box while you're presenting. Yeah. So, so I, I was going to, I have a little like break in my notes between each mapper to Good. pause for questions before we go into the next one. And I right. figured it might be as long as it's a manageable number. I of think questions, that's a but. really good, good idea because you're right. Um, we don't want to move on. And then at the very end, try to answer some of those. Yeah. Questions. Yeah. Um, I was also going to just dump the list of links in the chat just right off the bat just so that I think that's great right there and handy and in I, the order I that I'm going to talk that about I would them. you know I'll do I'll copy that and put it in in our follow-up as well okay <clears throat> so um, I'll do that right now and then while we're yeah go ahead and do that and then I'll I'll grab it and um Oh, it's not. Um, it's not taking them as a hyperlink. It's just taking the straight text. So I think um, I can work with that. In a you second. can also just email it to me if you want. And okay, um, I'll make sure that everybody gets those because I follow up with the um, link anyway. You know the the recording link. So, um, and I usually follow up with the recording link, some resources and additional links, as well as the registration for the next couple programs. Okay. Yeah. 
Hey, Barbara. Hi, Paul. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. We're really moving through these uh, wetland training programs. It's yeah. I want to see how you're going to organize the field sessions with all these people. <laughs> I know. Well, the <laughs> tough thing is, is um, we'll have to limit the in-person to 75 or 80. Okay. And so far, we've had about 120, 130 people sign up. But not, I don't know if everybody's going to be able to, you know, take a Friday off because it will be a half day. Yeah, still 75 or 80 is a lot of people for a field trip. Right. Well, <laughs> I'll I'll tell you since we're we've got a few minutes. Um the field trip program, we're gonna have about five different um certified wetland scientists. We're gonna have Mark Jacobs, Mark West, Rick and Sandy, Mary Ann, and some more uh DES professionals as well. And we're gonna break up into stations. So we'll probably have 15 people in each station. And so they'll go from site to site and we'll look at different functions and values at each site. That's good. That's good. So that's the plan. So we're not all gonna be, you know, 80 of us crammed around <laughs> one speaker because that yeah. would be hard. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's the plan. And we're, we're going to the site in April to check it out and see. Yeah. So much distance there is between walking the sites. Hi, Bart. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what they're doing down there, but she went down there. They said they're going to take her at 930. And I just got a text message from my wife, and they're just taking her into the uh, ER right now. So oh. I haven't got a clue. It's, it's hard to... Uh, figure out um, procedures and things. Mm. Um, it, it can really take a, much longer than anticipated. So so I'm glad you can join us. Maybe that'll be a good option yeah. just to, while you're waiting. Well, she's a rugged woman, so. <laughs> well, I wish you the best with that. Yeah, well, she spent a year in Iraq, so. Wow. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll wait a few more minutes before we get started, but thank you all for joining us. If you want to grab a drink or get settled, um, we'll start right at noon, so you have about five minutes to, to grab what you need to, to be here for our um, hour program, and maybe, Stephanie, you think it'll be an hour plus some time for questions? Yeah, for sure. I, um, you know, I noticed that it was scheduled for 90 minutes, I believe. So I don't know if we'll take the entire 90, but that's depending fine. On questions, yeah. we could. We, we, you know, in the past we were doing lunch and learns, which were pretty strict to an hour. Cause I know people were trying to stay in their lunch hours, but this program, this series, I thought we'd give a, a little more time because it can be a little, uh, tight if you're trying to answer some questions, but if we finish in an hour, that's great too. I'm not um, all right. Uh, hello, Leslie. Howdy, Barbara. Am I on as a co-host? Nope, but I can absolutely change you right now. Just um, so that and Perfect. I'll make Stephanie a co-host too. Um, that way, if you need to let anybody in. Now, is that just under participants? Yes, it should be under participants. No, I've got it. Great. It's coming up. Good. Okay. So I, I will go ahead and let folks in. Oh, awesome. And it's funny, before you set the co-host setting, I had a record button. And now it's gone. Oh, I noticed that too. Well, we are recording because um, my, okay. at least on my setup, I know we are. So um, I think, yeah, once you, once I make you co-host, you, you are under my setup system. <laughs> so.
and I, um, I, at one point I put the automatic re record button because that way then we just know we're getting it all. And it's, it's easier to do that than forget to record these. So that's the, So yes, I've been very pleased with the participation in the wetland training series. Like I said, we've had about 130 people sign up for these Zooms and um, pretty close to 100 in attendance during these um, the live Zooms. So it's always wow. a good crowd. So it's a good time to remind everybody, we do ask you to remain muted because there are so many people online. It, uh, the background noise can interfere with our program. So, so if you've joined early, thank you. But uh, remember to remain muted during the program. And just a couple more minutes, we'll get going. Hi, Sandy. Thanks for joining us. Stephanie, how many years have you been with DES now? Oh, I think I'm going on seven. Really? Okay. Yeah. Nice. nice. Yeah, I started as an intern. So it's kind of fun to think about as you know, this time of year when we do the solicitations for interns. Yep. I think, yeah. Well, these are our future staffers. Right, right. <laughs> Good for you. That's a that's lovely. Yeah. Lovely amount of time. Uh, I think I'm going on my seventh year here at NHACC. So oh wow. Yeah. I was bummed to miss the annual conference this year. It was a oh, I know. Yeah. I felt bad. You you uh, ended up getting sick right right in time for that. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Well, Marianne Tilton covered for you, and she um, as she does. <laughs> yeah, she yes, and she she really uh, did double duty that day. She had two presentations, so. Um, I'm glad she was able to um, cover this topic because I know, um, yeah, I know it's of interest to a lot of commissions. So it's great yeah. to have, have DES show everybody how to use it and why it's so important to access that information when you're checking out permits. And I think once you get in the hang of it, it's pretty easy to use. I I think so. You know, that's the good news. Yeah, I'm going to touch on that too. Some of the similarities between. The various mappers. Yes, right, right. All right, so it is noon, so I'm going to get going. So hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services online mapping tools. Um, my name is Barbara Richter, and I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. And NHACC is a nonprofit organization working to support local conservation commissions so that they can better protect their natural resources in their communities. <clears throat> so before we get started, just a couple quick reminders. Um, so we are recording this program. I'll be sending the recording link out um, probably tomorrow. I have a couple meetings this afternoon. So tomorrow I'll get that out to you along with some additional links and resources. And I'll also include the registration for some upcoming wetland training programs. So make sure you read all the way to the bottom of that email. Um, we do um, ask you to use the chat box to ask questions. Um, again, it's gonna be kind of a larger group. So if you ask questions in the chat box along the bottom of your screen there, I'll be monitoring that and I'll be asking Stephanie. She said she will be breaking between different mapper programs. So we'll have the opportunity to kind of ask questions as we go along. So, and again, those of you who are joining us, please remain um, muted for the program just so we can have better audio for everybody. So um, 
hopefully, I think I see a lot of familiar names and faces. So thank you all for, for joining us. Um, this is session three in our wetland training series. Um, today's program will provide an introduction to several of New Hampshire DES's online GS, GIS mapping tools. Um, and these programs can really be helpful to access data when you're evaluating your natural resources. Um, helpful for you know even doing NRI work as well as reviewing any of those wetland permits that you come across. So Stephanie is going to be covering uh, the wetlands permit planning tool, one-stop data mapper, the and the aquatic restoration mapper, and maybe a couple more, right, Stephanie? Yes. All right. So so hold on. Don't don't get <laughs> overwhelmed. It's going to be okay because we you can you can always practice later. So uh, we've invited Stephanie Tetro from New Hampshire DES uh, to give us an overview of these programs. And Stephanie is the Inland Wetlands Permitting Section Supervisor at New Hampshire DES. And she's been at DES for seven years now, she said. So we're really happy that she's been able to help us um, provide these trainings for us. Um, she provides regular uh, regulatory expertise of wetlands permitting and inspection, and she supervises the review of wetlands permits, permit applications and decisions in the inland wetlands permit section of DES. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, I'm going to turn the program over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Barbara. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for having me here today. I'm really excited to be a part of this whole training series and presentations. I hope you'll find this useful for the important work that you're all doing in your towns. Um, Barbara covered pretty much all of my housekeeping items that I was gonna mention. Uh, I was gonna say, just don't hesitate to ask questions. We'll be monitoring the chat box. So, and again, I'll be breaking in between the different mappers that I'll be presenting to give you a chance to ask questions before we move on to the next one. Uh, I think we have about 90 minutes, so we might take the whole time, but it should give us plenty of time to have a good discussion, field questions, and talk about a variety of different scenarios. I'm gonna cover a lot. I'm gonna do live demonstrations as much as possible. Um, and with that, I think let's begin. I will share my screen. Uh, I may turn my camera off while I'm talking just to minimize the risk of any, um, you know, bandwidth issues as I'm trying to do live demonstrations. So let's see. Can you all see my screen now? Yep, I've got it. Okay, thank you. All right, so online GIS mapping tools for Conservation Commission planning and wetland impact assessment. Just real quick, can you see the whole screen? I have some of the Zoom boxes up here and I just wanna make sure it's not blocking anything on your end. I okay. can see the whole screen. Okay, thank you. All right, so the plan for today is to do a quick overview, talk about the goals of today. I'm gonna discuss some of the common features and considerations that you can think of and get familiar with as you're using these variety of mappers. I'm gonna cover some basic symbology that will also you'll, you'll become familiar with and be able to identify across all of the different programs. And then I'm gonna do a crash course through this list of mappers, the Aquatic Restoration Mapper, the New Hampshire Wildlife Corridors, USGS Stream Stats. We'll touch on the NHB Data Check Tool, the Fish and Wildlife Service, NWI Wetlands Mapper, Historic Aerials, and then finally the Permit Planning Tool along with one-stop data mapper and granite view. So the goal, the overarching goal of all of these programs is to improve access to spatial data and to be constantly improving data quality for the purpose of informing project planning and avoidance and minimization of environmental impacts. They're also useful to inform town-wide master planning and prioritization of preservation or restoration projects, and even to inform project review and decision making, including the reviews that conservation commissions do of DES wetlands permit applications and local applications. 
So some common things across all of these mappers before we dive into anything specific are a few things. So first, these disclaimers, you'll see them on almost every mapping program. And we can be pretty quick to click and just to move on from that disclaimer and get into the mapper. But it's really important that we understand what that is saying and, and that we acknowledge the limitations of the tools. The data that's provided within these mapping products is only really suitable for screening purposes. It's reconnaissance level information. And in many cases, the actual boots on the ground conditions will vary and sometimes significantly. I think NWI is probably the best example of this where it's really a layer created based off of aerial imagery and computer modeling, but the real wetland boundaries must be determined in the field for permitting purposes. So as long as we understand that and we're using these tools, understanding those limits, then we'll be in a stronger position. So the disclaimers will also warn you that the data that is being presented is under constant revision. Some data sets are pretty static, but others are being updated regularly. And as more data is added or changed, the layers and in the information they display might change. So on that, it's also, really important to read the metadata that's associated with each layer that you might be using, or it could be informing your decisions or setting you up for a certain review process. So it's good to understand the metadata to know when it may have been last updated or who to contact if you have any trouble with the data, maybe how the data was, was created and presented. That should all be available in the metadata for each data set. Oops. So many of these viewers that I'm going to talk about are using a common data source. So a, a well-designed uh, data or uh, mapping platform will be built in such a way that the data that's being presented is being taken right from the source. So as that source is being revised and updated periodically, what you're seeing on any of these mapping programs is also up to date. And once we get a, a sense for that, you can then identify that some of the data layers that you're using on the permit planning tool are the same layers from the same source that may be being presented on the New Hampshire Coastal Viewer or Granite View or in kind of the reverse direction, um, considering the National Wetlands Inventory data set that's managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service at the federal level, but that's being served through granite and into or, or across onto these data mapping platforms for our consumption. So they all gonna, they're, they may look familiar. And then on the same tone, some of them are built on common software platforms. So they actually really look and feel very similar to each other. So the, when you break that down, some of the data layers or the data mappers are designed for displaying their data for a very specific purpose, like the wildlife corridors map or the ARM aquatic restoration mapper. Or then there are those that display their data for very general multiple purposes like Granite is referred to as the statewide GIS clearinghouse. So the permit planning tool, one-stop coastal viewer, they're all similar clearinghouses for a wide range of end users. Another common feature to consider when you're using, especially these one-stop or permit planning tool, those are built on what's called geocortex. And so, one function that, that happens here that I think can trip people up pretty commonly is how certain layers are only set to be visible at certain extents. So you have to be zoomed in or out to a certain extent in order for that layer to be visible. And when you're using the layer list, and I'll show you this in a broader uh, screenshot later on, but if you're trying to visualize this wetland types layer and you can't here because it's grayed out and italicized, that's indicating to you that you're not zoomed far in enough. 
So if you just zoom your map in further, that layer on the layer list should become available for you to click and turn on, and then you'll be able to see it. So some common symbology too that you might find across the variety of mappers, and they're not actually always identified as I have them here with titles above each one, you might just see these icons. So this like stack of pancakes, that's indicating that if you click that, that icon, you're going to reveal the list of available data layers. Similarly for base maps, this information icon and the legend list, the legend and the layer list may look kind of similar, but the, the legend icon has that bulleted listed format. So multiple different mappers that we'll see today are using these similar symbology. So once you get a feel for using any one of them, you'll be more comfortable using the others. So the aquatic restoration mapper is a unique, exceptional feat of symbology that I'm looking forward to breaking down for you here today. So here's a, just a screenshot from the front page. Um, I'm gonna jump into the web browser. So are you guys all still seeing this as I just opened the actual yep. mapper? Okay. I can see it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm having trouble because uh, We've got about four people on the right side of our screen here that aren't. Uh, or... Oh, is the participant list not? You can you can hit the little red dot and your participant list will close. Okay. That helps. Okay. So I'm not going to get into this aspect for each of the mappers, but I just want to take a second to acknowledge that many of these are designed and built in partnerships with sister organizations that share that common goal of improved data sharing and data quality. So we wouldn't have any of these if it weren't for those innovative minds coming together and getting it done. So in some of the acknowledgement screens where they're offering the same disclaimer that I described earlier, they'll highlight you know, who's who's behind the project, who's responsible for providing this tool. And that's that's what we see at the top of the page here. But before we get into the mapper, we have to understand the disclaimer. You hit that box, you agree to the terms, and you select OK. Now we are in. So the aquatic restoration mapper is extremely useful for assessing a proposed stream crossing project, either a replacement or a new crossing structure, or for targeting potential stream restoration projects in town. So the first thing I'm going to do is point out some of the features that we're seeing here. I'm going to move the Zoom stuff around. Up here, you'll see some of these symbols that we were talking about a minute ago. Some of them we didn't talk about, but you kind of see the variation here, the legend with the little bulleted list. This mapper offers this more menu where you can open up these other icons. Um, mm. I do want to open the layer list. And now we have this list of available data layers that we can toggle on and off to exercise the, the function of this mapper. So another important icon that I want to point out on this aquatic restoration mapper, I went back to that more menu to see all of the available options. The information icon that opens this menu here and provides links and some explanation about how to use the mapper and how to interpret some of the symbology that we'll see in a minute. This mapper is really a, a cool design. Whoever put this together is brilliant. And we'll jump right to it, I guess, to show you what I'm, what I'm going on about. Um, one thing, if, if anybody's following along on their own screens, 
these links here open up to some really useful flyers, just one page informational flyers that really break down, you know, what is geomorphic compatibility and aquatic organism passage and how were those metrics scored and pro provided on this mapper. So I have a site picked out. I'm going to go to Canopy Lake Road in Freedom, New Hampshire. So all I did there was type the address into that search bar and hit, hit search. And that brings us here to Canopy Lake Road. We're in Freedom, New Hampshire. I'm just zooming out a couple clicks and orienting here. I'm going to turn the layer list back on. And I'm actually going to shut all of the layers off until we get started. So they offer this checkbox here where you can do that in one or two clicks. So what we're seeing here, I see Trout Pond with Shawtown Brook flowing down into, into town and into this water body here. When we get back over here to the layer list, to point out some of these, to just to highlight, I guess, what I think the, the main features are of this mapper are the aquatic organism passage scores, the geomorphic compatibility scores. And as I turn these on, I want you to notice that there are, see this half of a triangle symbol appeared, or I'm sorry, half of a square. And then we turn on geomorphic compatibility and the other half of the square appears. So I'm gonna do that again, just so you see it. And so each half of the square is representing the aquatic organism passage and the geomorphic compatibility score. The other really valuable feature on this are these survey photos. So you can turn that data layer on as well. You won't see any symbology associated with it, but I'll show you how to access it in a second. Um, there are quite a few layers here. I'm not going to go into all of them. Another, though, that I will highlight is this hydraulic vulnerability score. It's another type of rating system. This is indicating how the structure, the structure being the culvert or the bridge, how it will function in this 10-year flood frequency event. They also offer a structural condition score, which rates like the structural integrity, whether it's a crumbling concrete or a brand new HDPE pipe or a rusted out, you know, rusted bottom arch culvert. So I'm going to shut that off again, that 10 year vulnerability score, because I want to focus on aquatic organism and geomorphic compatibility. So Geomorphic compatibility, I'll just give you the, the quick and dirty. It is a measure of how the stream crossing is compatible with the natural channel form and the ability to transport sediment. So during a flood event, this, this metric, geomorphic compatibility, considers the shape of the stream channel, the width of the channel, compared to the width of the culvert or the bridge, the alignment, whether the culvert is installed in a natural alignment or if it forces the stream to take a sharp corner, um, and the slope. So all of those physical dimensions of a stream channel and how does the culvert or the bridge fit into that. Ideally, we want culverts and bridges to be as transparent to the stream as possible. And that, so that is geomorphic compatibility. Aquatic organism passage may be intuitive. It is the, uh, the, the score in this case is a measure of how passable a bridge or a culvert is to fish and other aquatic organisms. So you can imagine on Trout Pond, this stream re leading down from Trout Pond, you'd think wild brook trout or Eastern brook trout at least would be a, an important species to target for aquatic organism passage. So here we have the aquatic organism or AOP 
score, the geomorphic score, and the survey photos. Those are the only three data layers that we're, we're showing on this screen right now. I'm gonna click on one of these icons, one of these locations. And the reason you might do this as a commission member is if you're reviewing a proposed project for jurisdictional impacts related to a, a project on one of these crossings, or if you're trying to kind of look around town and see where these hot spots could be for prioritizing a restoration project. So here I, I can tell, you know, if, if this is something's going on at this culvert that's really indicating that aquatic organisms cannot pass, you might put a little flag there for yourself to say, hey, what, what's going on there? And can we maybe pull together a grant or a project to restore aquatic organism passage at that culvert? So I'm going to click on that square. And I get this pop up window. Uh, I want to point out that it says one of two here. And this is kind of a, a common format that you'll see on other mappers too. If you clicked on, on a point on a different mapper, you may see this similar thing. Or you may not see what you think you wanted to see. But if you notice here, this is one of two, you have to toggle over to two of two. So I'll go back real quick. This is one of two. And this is showing the stream crossing survey data. So this is a, a whole list, I, and I'm not going to go through it all, but you can get the idea. There's a lot of data here that was collected by the DES field staff who went out in the field and assessed each one of these culverts all across the state. They collect all this data. It gets quality controlled before it gets put up onto this mapper for the public, and then you can, you can access it. It gives you the date of when the survey was conducted. Um, one parameter I do want to point out is the, the stream dimensions. There are some down here that talk about the bank full width. So if you were trying to design a new culvert crossing or design a restoration project, if we're trying to remove the culvert or the dam or anything, you could use these surveyed points almost as reference sites or reference dimensions to get yourself an idea or to provide a you know a review on a proposed project where this is revealing that this range of bank full widths at this location on the channel is what it is and if the culvert that you're considering is only three feet wide you might say hey that that doesn't appear to be geomorphically compatible so all that data is here for your consumption. The other fantastic thing about this mapper is that for each of these surveyed points, I'm gonna to toggle over to two of two, there are photos, there are a series of, usually about at least 10 photos for each culvert. So I'll click on one just for demonstration and you get this nice big clear photo of what the structure was on that date of the survey. So I'm going to close that pop up box. And I just want to point out this whole bottom half here. These are New Hampshire Fishing Game Aquatic Wildlife Action Plan fisheries layers. So there's a layer for each fish species. And it is based on New Hampshire Fish and Games surveys that they do monitoring species in abundance across the state. So you can turn them all on. And you'll see here too, well, there, there are other things here. These are the wetland polygons and the conservation lands with this green hatching. But now that all those layers are on, if you click on that same point, now we have one of five to choose from at that point. So you can cycle through here and say, oh, that also in that location, they've identified some a, a species of concern. They identify here the EBT, Eastern Brook Trout. Um, I won't venture to guess what BS is, but you can get into the, that um, bridal shiner, thank you. You can get into the information tab again that I showed you earlier 
and find the links that really decode all this stuff for you. So species of concern, there's the wild eastern brook trout, gives you a nice profile and a picture. Uh, predicted cold water fishery, the different type of metric to assess the potential for brook trout. And then those photos that we saw a minute ago. So I'll close that again. I'll shut this off just to clean it up. All right. There are some other really powerful functions available in these icons up here. Um, I'll describe it generally to say, if you were, say we, we zoom to the, zoom out to the extent of the town of freedom. I'm not seeing town boundary right here, but just for conversation's sake, if we're, if we're looking at your whole town like this and you can see all these scores you can use these icons to filter each crossing so that if you only want to look at the ones that have a low rating, you can do that. You filter out all of the, the green ones, and then you can focus your eye on the areas that may, may need some attention. Same for um, aquatic organism passage. And you can, this other function here are like general statistics. You'll get the percent of passability for this whole extent that we're looking at here. All right, that was my crash course on the aquatic restoration mapper. I see some bubbles in the chat. Barbara, do you want to maybe moderate those if uh, yes, it looks like um, most of them are um, questions about the the viewing and and how to get your um, speaker um, speaker view up on that right hand corner. But if anybody has a question right now about the um, aquatic restoration mapper, go ahead and put it in the chat, um, and we can get those answered before we move on to a different mapper. Does anybody have any questions about those um, really cool features that uh, the um, those squares provide? The green ones are again the ones that are provide um, passage, aquatic passage, and don't necessarily need to be replaced. And then the ones that are in the red blocks are ones you would probably want to look for. Um, that probably need to be restored or replaced. And so <clears throat> the questions coming in are, um, can I get a link to the aquatic restoration mapper? And absolutely, I'm going to be um, sending out the links to these. Uh, they were also in the um, original um, reminder email that I sent out as well. I sent a long list of resources. So I'll, I'll continue to send resources and you can just pick and choose what you wanna look at. Um, <clears throat> And the other question is, can this mapper be downloaded and clipped um, clipped to our town? So you can, um, I think what you mean, clip to the town and then save it, um, save it as just the map of your town. Is that what you were thinking, John? You can unmute John and ask your question. I wanna make sure we get the, get what you're driving at. had to find the unmute button. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I use a couple of GIS um, editors. And so I can do the clipping. I just want to know if the full data set is available to be downloaded so that I could do the clip. I don't, I don't believe it is for this one. I, I could be wrong. I can follow up on that. But I, I I am inclined to say that it's it's not readily available for download. If it is, you may find it on the the Granite Clearinghouse website. Uh, but it, I just know that it's it's very dynamic. They're constantly, you know, mm. doing these surveys in the field, right. doing the quality control, and I, I'm inclined to think that it's it's not there for download. Okay, I understand uh, that if there's rapid data updating. 
uh, I, I can use it to present, well, uh, to do planning for our town culverts and such. Um, I, I, just, I just figured it would be yeah. way, way less data on my system, but that's okay. Thank you. I was going to just look here to see if there's a way to even download this information, but it doesn't seem like it. Yeah. Okay. And Sandy mentioned that the data can be downloaded in Excel. Um, okay. The other question we have are where are the legends for each of the layers? Sure. So we hit uh, one kind of funny thing about this mapper, I think, is you can only have one panel open at a time. So right now we have the layers menu open. If you choose the legend icon, now we see the legend for the layers that we had selected. So if we had the whole suite of fisheries layers on here too, you'd see the symbols and the legends for each of those. But because we only had AOP and geomorphic compatibility, we have surveys selected, but uh, there, like I said, there's no symbology associated with that layer. So you can see that here, full passage, reduced, no passage. And again, that's coming from this legend icon. Okay. All right, well, I think that all that was it for questions for the aquatic restoration mapper. And again, I'll be sending um, sending the link to these programs to you tomorrow. So you can um, check it out yourself and just kind of go in and, and uh, just test out a few things and, and um, click on a few boxes and see what you get. I, I recommend it's one of those things that the more you kind of mess around with, the more you'll find and discover because there's so much information in here. But um, once you get used to kind of navigating one of these programs that they're very similar, so you can move from one to the next without too much trouble. Yeah. So I just dropped the link for the next mapper that I'm going to talk about into the chat. I didn't think that would work earlier, so I apologize I didn't get to it for, for the last one. But this here is the New Hampshire Wildlife Corridors map. Um, I don't know if, if many of you have used this yet yourself. I think it's, it's fairly new. Um, something that we've started kind of adopting in the Wetlands Bureau, you, you know, referencing this more and more frequently. It's really a great tool for visualizing habitat and uh, you know, animal connectivity across the landscape, wildlife corridors across the landscape. So from the metadata and the information available on this mapper, I learned that it was created by finding areas of wildlife movement and dispersal. Those were identified using a wildlife connectivity model. And then another model was used to map the connections between core wildlife habitats that were identified discreetly. And then after that, the corridors where the wildlife were predicted to most easily move, especially along riparian corridors, were selected. And that's what we're about to see here. So there's uh, different features related to each of these colors, but kind of their linear nature is what is indicating their potential to function as a wildlife corridor. So I'm going to pop back over to the actual mapper. This is what it looks like when you first come in. This little info box has the description that I just, just, just talked about. It's how the mapper was created. Uh, you'll see similar symbology here, that bulleted list for the legend, stack of pancakes for the layers, this base map gallery info. Uh, this little guy here is uh, indicating measurement tools and then sharing options and printing. So similar icons. I'm going to search right to Mill Road in Stoddard. So here we are. I'll 
come back out a couple ticks. I'm going to open this layer list. And so this is an example that I was mentioning earlier. It looks like everything is inaccessible. I can't click on anything, can't, I'm not seeing it on the on the map. So I know that that's indicating to me that I'm not zoomed in or out to the right extent. And, you know, it's, it's natural to think, you know, if we're assessing wildlife corridors, that's really like a landscape parameter. So these layers are only visible when you're zoomed out to a landscape level. I'm going to turn layers off for starters just to get the introduction in but you can see in this area I did I searched for Mill Road just to get us in this general vicinity this is Highland Lake coming down from the north Island Pond you see Fisher Brook here this other brook um, and Dead Brook there's a confluence here of several riparian corridors and water bodies so you can imagine also that there, you know, with Mill Village, there's probably some residential development pressure here. And by using this mapper, I think you, you could take it as a tool to identify these priority areas that could be preserved and protected for the purpose of maintaining that habitat connectivity across the landscape. So over here in the layer list, um, again, there's some overlap. We see this stream crossings aquatic organism passage score. That's from the mapper that we were just looking at. Same with the photos. We have uh, conservation and public lands. That is relevant to this wildlife corridors discussion. Um, these lakes and ponds and rivers and streams, these are all on the back end. They're derived from the NWI US Fish and Wildlife Service data set. I'm not going to turn those on right now because we can more or less see the water features that we would be talking about. Uh, this one, though, the prioritized habitat blocks, potential wildlife corridors, and secondary corridors. So I did a little research to find out that the potential wildlife corridors layer are the top scoring linkages for all focal species combined. So these, darker orange linear features that we're seeing kind of here and here are identifying corridors that may benefit multiple species that have a variety of dispersal and uh, movement behaviors. The secondary corridors layer, the yellower version of it, are the top scoring linkages for each species individually. So I suspect if you dig into the attributes of each of these, you may be able to identify which species they are referring to. But for me, visually, again, kind of stepping back for that reconnaissance purpose, I'm looking at this thinking, OK, there's, there's something going on in the landscape here that has the potential at least to facilitate connectivity. The prioritized habitat blocks over 50 acres, that I interpret as just suggesting, you know, large blocks of undeveloped land that could be considered for preservation to kind of stitch this landscape together, especially where we have these uh, sharper green, like lime green polygons. These are conserved lands already conserved under an easement or like state parks or um, you know what, what have you they are they're already conserved protected lands so this extent right here i think is an, a good example of how you could use these layers in this tool to identify you know this kind of whole thing fisher brook dead brook connecting to highland lake sort of spanning between these two areas that are already conserved, it would be valuable to at least explore the idea of securing some preservation through here to, to protect that corridor for wildlife to get from this huge area to that huge area along the riparian corridor too. 
so this function here that I just played with a little bit, um, I will do it on the prioritized habitat blocks just because it's a little bit bolder. You can use that little drop down carrot, it gives you the legend right there. And then you can slide the opacity to make it more or less transparent. Kind of helps you visualize, especially when I'll show you here, this is the wildlife action plan, uh, highest ranked habitat layer. So you may be familiar with those that this you know pink, green, and orange symbology that indicates pink being the highest ranked habitat in the state. Green is highest ranked in the biological region, and orange is called supporting landscape. So these happen to overlap this this particular location, the prioritized habitat blocks and that pink highest ranked habitat polygon, which also just supports, if you're interpreting this, this is valuable riparian habitat and has blocks over 50 acres and is modeled to at least um, potentially be a suitable wildlife corridor. So, this, you know, is obviously a very specific use. There are other layers on here that we just briefly touched on, but you could use this to maybe identify other um, rivers and streams that could be flowing through and may not show up as clearly as those did on the base map. Are there any questions about this? I don't see any in the, let's see, in the, hold on, hold on. Um, nope, I don't see any in the chat box right now, but if anybody has more questions about um, the quarters map, um, again, there's a lot of information um, in this, this mapper. So it's pretty cool to check out. I also really do like the way that you can find um, the same, you know, the same um, data in, and a lot of these maps that you'll find the highest ranked habitat, the wildlife action plan, highest ranked habitat in, in many of these mappers. So you can kind of compare um, the data from one mapper to the next. Um, let's see, I do have a question. Um, can you describe how, how to print up maps by town? Is there a way to... Um, yeah, I can zoom I'll in on your town, I guess, and then maybe can you save it as a PDF or? Yeah, generally all of these mappers have a print function. Some is more, some are more um, functional than others. I honestly have not tried to print a map off of this particular mapper, but I'm uh, bold enough to try it right here. So I see this print icon and you know, this is a common feature too. Uh, I know with the permit planning tool, you can identify a title, you can put your name on it. Um, you can put your organization if you're trying to present it in a certain way. You can select if the legend is gonna be available on the map. And then I guess you just hit print. We'll see where it prints in our office, but um, <laughs> so I, I don't think there is the ability to really isolate your town uh, other than just zooming to the proper extent. Um, someone mentioned that they use screenshots and then insert as a picture into a Word doc. So oh yeah, that works a, too. A, yeah, that's another way to to um, grab the screen. Yeah. Um, and, but the, the print feature is pretty nice. Let's see, um, how are the conserved blocks determined? Are parcels current in current use included? Um, oh, good question. Um, yeah. I'm not, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think, think current, current uses. Use. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think current uses either. Um, and I know that these blocks, so this, this lime green features that we're seeing here are coming straight from New Hampshire granite. Right, so, UNH, yeah. Yeah. 
in my experience on, as a member of a conservation commission, we were responsible for um, making sure our town was up to date with New Hampshire granite with all of our conserved blocks. Yes, that's correct. A couple years ago, we did, we worked with the Nature Conservancy was working with UNH to update the granite um, conservation layer. So um, they actually requested, um, we, we sent out a, 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 an announcement to all of our members to please send any updated conservation lands to um, the granite mapper program. But they are always kind of updating every six months or so. Um, they do, like, like I said, a really big update every two or three years. But in the meantime, they just try to kind of keep up as they can. But your town has to basically send um, the files and the information to Granite. And I think on the Granite Mapper, there is a location that says um, how to send information or how to contact um the um the source and another comment was that current use parcels are not permanently conserved um and town owned property doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily permanently preserved either so the green that you see on those maps um would be permanently preserved um conservation lands with either um, ownership by a conservation organization or um, ownership through a town that may have a uh, conservation easement on it. So there's there's kind of a, a um, more defined um, permanent conservation um, for those green blocks that are used in, in most of these mapper programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall we? All right. I think that's it for questions on that one. All right. Next, I am planning to talk about the USGS StreamStats mapper. So StreamStats is pretty different from the others that we just looked at or that we're going to look at in a few more minutes. It is much more technical than the other mappers, which renders it somewhat less user friendly. But it is packed with a ton of information about the hydraulic conditions of a defined watershed area. So I did drop the link to this in the chat, if anybody does wish to follow along. When you first open it up, this is what it looks like. You get the whole United States. And similar to other mappers, uh, they have a search uh, function here to search for a location. You'll notice too that these this one doesn't have exactly the same symbology that we were talking about, the, the layer list and the legend icons. Um, but you can kind of glean and you can usually navigate there. They're usually at least that user friendly to navigate through the layers or the available base maps. So for this demonstration, I found four mile spur in Colebrook, New Hampshire. So I typed that in here. StreamStats always kind of provides these options based on what you type into the search box. And I have found that it's useful to click on this option rather than just like hitting enter on your keyboard, go with what they give you here, you know, as long as it matches, obviously. But if there's some slight formatting differences in the way you type, you might not find what you're looking for. So here we go. I think I clicked that too funny. Oh, and we're not working. Hold on. Okay. So you get to your location. I'm just going to close this. It gives you the identifying the Latin long here, but uh, visually can't see. And I was thinking in this spot, I just zoomed out a couple ticks, but you can see Four Mile Spur Road. This is Four Mile Brook or Four Mile River kind of flowing down the valley. And I thought, well, what if we were entertaining a proposed development up here? So 
whoever it is is going to have to come off of Four Mile Spur and cross Four Mile Brook to get up here. And part of at least DES's technical review would be to assess the the hydraulic conditions of the stream that they're proposing to cross. And if you're familiar with our stream crossing rules, streams are categorized as a tier one, two, three, or four, primarily based on watershed size. So stream stats is a pretty solid way of determining the watershed drainage area size. And then that dictates the design criteria and permitting process that would be that a project would be subject to. So we find your location and what we're seeing here, this, this brook is really just a part of the base map. That's not real data there for us to click on. You don't get that real data until you select your study area. So when, after you zoom in, if say we were close to the Maine or the Vermont border, those would be options here too. Connecticut River Basin sounds intuitive, but I always just click New Hampshire. And that reveals this pixelated stream flow line. And it looks a little wonky. You can see, you know, it doesn't perfectly line up with the base map stream line there, but this pixelated line is derived from a digital elevation model. So it's, it's just a different type of data and it's generally more accurate. You can really see in the hillshade how those lines follow the valley contours. So we're still just kind of looking at our spot here. We know this person's gonna try and cross Four Mile Brook right there. And we wanna know about the drainage area that contributes to that point on the stream. So in order to get that, you have to select this button here, delineate. And when you do, see we have the finger icon or, uh, or cursor icon as a little finger. And if you hit delineate, it turns into a crosshairs. So you use your crosshairs to select one of these pixels in the location of the proposed crossing. And it tells you your point is valid. If you clicked like over here somewhere, it would not be a valid point. And it goes ahead and starts delineating your basin. So it can take like a couple of seconds, depending on your, your speed that you're working with. Um, don't worry, I do have a backup if this doesn't work. <laughs> there we go. So it did that on its own. It zoomed right out to the extent of the basin that it identified as being the contributing drainage area. So any precipitation that falls within this yellow area eventually drains to this point. And with that, you can do a whole lot of analysis to assess the range of flow that a crossing structure may experience at this point under a variety of different scenarios. So one really cool thing that I think is especially cool because it's generally pretty accessible is you can download data off of USGS stream stats and you can download it in different formats. So I just clicked download basin and it offers you different file types. Shapefile you could put right into ArcGIS. This KML will offer a uh, file right, readily available into Google Earth. So I hit that KML, so it downloaded that onto my browser here, and I'll just open it real quick. And it gives you the drainage area overlaid on Google Earth. And pretty, with a, a couple more clicks, I'm gonna right click on this white polygon. You go to properties. You can change the color of that polygon. So I'll do it yellow just because it's consistent with the stream stats symbols. And you can change the transparency again. So now you can really visualize what that contributing drainage area looks like on the landscape. You can 
move around in Google Earth. You can get an idea of how steep, how developed it is. Obviously, this is a relatively undeveloped area, um, but you can imagine maybe a flashy mountain stream. Uh, just gives you that kind of landscape perspective of the drainage area. So I'll go back into stream stats. And we're still looking at the same drainage area here. This menu hasn't changed. You can, when you, I downloaded it, that was uh, its own process. I can continue on to download some of the parameters that exist within the drainage area. So what I mean by that are the peak flow statistics. There are a variety of flow scenarios available here that you can, you can download. Characteristics of the drainage area, like the percent of it that may be wetlands, the percent of it that may be impervious, gives you an, another indicator of how flashy the stream might be. Um, it gives you some precipitation options to choose from. And ultimately, you can download a, a PDF that gives you all that information uh, kind of packed up into a little report. So it's offering these peak flow, low flow, a variety of flow scenarios, and then the basin characteristics, which you have to drop down further. And some are automatically selected for you. Um, I guess sometimes they're not, but drainage area is one that is, you know, particularly informative. So I'll just select that one for now because I don't want to overwhelm the system. But you can see the precipitation parameters, percentage of wetlands. There's one for percentage of coniferous forest. So all, all characteristics that may indicate how that stream is going to behave and, and inform how you should design your crossing to accommodate its behavior. I'll hit open report. And this is what you get. Similarly to the print function on the other mappers, you can title your report. You can add some comments there, who did it, when you did it. Uh, it gives you a little screenshot map here. And then um, this, these are, you know, I only selected one parameter. So it gives me drainage area, 6.93 miles. So right with that, I can tell you, this is a tier three stream. It's gonna have to pass the 100 year flow be designed in accordance with certain criteria, at least for the state wetlands permit. And then you can download that here as well. So that, that stream stats. And I'm, I'm really just giving you this high level crash course. I really strongly encourage you all to get in there, select all of those parameters and, and see what happens, you know, or see, you know, what you can learn about your own drainage areas or on any of the mappers. I'm, I'm not as familiar with stream stats. So that's very interesting to see all of that information you can gather and then download as a report. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. I'm not so seeing any questions. One more question. Are there um, probably intermediate streams included or does it need to be a, a level one stream? So I guess it looks like all the streams are included, right? Intermittent streams as well, or? Yeah, there is a limit I have found to, you know, small, like smaller streams may not be uh, picked up on this because I don't know if I can really start over. Um, when you get into the higher parts of a watershed and your streams are, are so much smaller, they may not be picked up by those, the digital elevation model. And so that, that is important. It doesn't mean you don't have a stream there. You know, we, we encounter that pretty frequently in the wetlands bureaus. You know, this, this, 
if someone was say there was a driveway crossing right here to get back here you know you can kind of see the hill shade there maybe there's still a defined scoured channel but it's not enough for this program to have identified it so when it, it, there's not a cutoff for stream order or a particular um, you know size drainage area it's uh, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you exactly how that gets cut off at this point as we see it here, but um, I can tell you if, if you think there's a stream here and it's not showing up on stream stats, that's probably a good idea to go out in the field and inspect it. Yeah. Is there a mapper that would give you a good indication of stream order? Um, or yeah. Better? So there, there is a subset of the New Hampshire hydrography data set that identifies the Strayler stream order. Okay. And you may be familiar with, with that as it pertains to the Shoreland Protection Act. Okay. Fourth order streams and greater are subject to the Shoreland Protection Act. And so we have a a set of those displayed on the permit planning tool. And if uh, I'll make a note to show you that when we get to that one in a few minutes. Okay, great. And then Sandy just mentions that people can select a checkbox that provides all the parameters in the report. Oh, okay, thanks Sandy. That must be one of the options when you're building a report over here. Yeah, really great information. All right, then let's see. Um, these were my screenshots I had prepared in case that didn't work live, but I just think that is cool. Just It's just interesting to look at. You get a very qualitative impression, but. All right, the next one I was gonna talk about is the NHB data check tool. So this it was on the list of online tools though it's not really a, a mapper as the other programs uh, are so it's a data screening tool provided by the des and the natural heritage bureau where the public can screen for known locations of rare species and exemplary natural communities it's most often used by permit applicants to satisfy a requirement for a permit application or for a grant application in New Hampshire. So when you get into the tool, you do have to register to obtain login credentials, which in my experience, they're very quick about. You just register, give your information and they'll return you with a, a registration. You, you can then access the tool. In order to run the tool, though, you must have landowner permission, so you really can't be running this tool for anybody's property without their permission. And if you, so in your capacity on the Conservation Commissions as you're reviewing um, proposed projects, I don't know how frequently you're seeing these data check reports, though if you do, I just, I'll mention that one thing that you want to kind of make sure you're paying attention to is that the users have selected all of the applicable permit types. So if you're reviewing a project that you know is going to require an alteration of terrain permit and a major impact wetlands permit, then you want to see both of those permit types listed because the permit type that's selected triggers a certain scope of review by the Natural Heritage Bureau. So that can affect their review and you want to make sure that they're, the project is filing a single data check for the entirety of their project. And when they do that, you get this data check report back to you. You either get it right away and it says there are no known records. That means there are no documented occurrences of rare species in the project area or exemplary natural communities, or you get a potential impacts letter. And if that's the case, then the NHB and New Hampshire Fish and Game staff perform a desktop analysis of the proposed project area. 
and they determine if the rare species or exemplary natural communities are likely to be present and if they may be impacted by the project. So that then feeds into the regulatory process, maybe informs some design revisions, year restrictions, certain types of best management practices that can result in having less or no impact on threatened or endangered species. So because you have to have the, the login credentials and the landowner permission, I'm not going to give you a full demo of that tool. I have the web page open right here just so you can kind of see at least that. You would launch the data check tool. That's where it prompts you to log in and you can kind of go, go from there. I'll drop this in the chat real quick. Are there any questions about the data check tool? Uh, the, the one question we did have um, was, um, how do you get permission from the landowner? And I know that certain um, permits, when they're signed, um, that provides um, or gives permission for the for access to the property. But but I does that include the um, data check tool as well? That's kind of a legal question, but I would err on the side of no. I think you okay. would need their express permission to to run that report. So you'd have to contact them and ask them. Is that yeah, your recommendation? That, yeah. that would be my recommendation. And, and I would, you know, couch that with, you know, I would also recommend you contact the Natural Heritage Bureau to, to get that uh, a solid answer. Gotcha. Um, okay. But to be careful, I would say you should have their express permission. I have heard uh, recently, Marianne was telling me how some towns have, may have done kind of like a, a master planning effort and done a data check report on the entire town. I haven't seen that myself, but I thought it was an interesting idea. So maybe something you, you could consider and look into. Okay. Yeah, I'll see if I can get more information on that as well. Because the other question was, um, can you provide, let's see. Um, yeah, for the purpose of updating our master plan, can we get a report of rare species and exemplary natural communities that exist somewhere on our town? And I think the Wildlife Action Plan has certainly some of that information, right? It may, yeah. They, they probably have a common source behind the scenes to some extent. But I can check with the uh, um, Natural Heritage Bureau and see um, the best way to get, get that information. Okay. All right. The next mapper I will be talking about is this U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Wetlands Inventory, or NWI, wetlands mapper. So when you navigate to that mapper, which you can do right here with the link I just dropped in the chat, you are likely to find yourself on this landing page. And it gives you all the information, who developed it, how they developed it, what its limitations are, the disclaimers again, um, some FAQs, but then you can get right down here to the, the actual mapper. And so this NWI, it was established by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to conduct a nationwide inventory of the United States wetlands to provide biologists and natural resource managers and the public with information on the, the distribution and classification of wetland types all across the country. I found that there are over 34 million wetland features displayed in the extent that we see here. There are 44, 34 million wetlands ma mapped by NWI across the US. I thought that was a cool number. So, the nice thing about this mapper is that it's quick and simple. You can easily navigate to your project location or your town, town-wide, and quickly get a picture of the wetland landscape and the classification types over a nice, crisp, current aerial image. So similar kind of layout here. We've got base maps. The different layers. These are really just just the wetlands, riparian corridors, um, 
and there some other here, managed lands, areas of interest. I'm not exactly sure what those are, but I would encourage you to explore them. Um, the print functions, and then this find a location. So I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna zoom into Bay Road and New Market. So how, how quick was that? How easy did I make that look? <laughs> um, and what you see here are just these different polygons with the wetland classification types. E2 indicates an estuarine system. PSS is palustrine scrub shrub. So all of these codes are the coded classification system from the Coordin manual. And I have a slide to share with you in a second that you may be familiar with. But if you if you weren't and you're just looking at this, you think, what are these codes? There is a decoder website that you can go to and type in E2EM1PD and it will return to you what that translates to. There's also a pretty handy chart you can use that is pretty easy to follow and you say E2EM and you can build what that classification scheme is based on that. Um, what you don't have on here though are any of the other data sets to overlay like floodplains or parcel boundaries for a more site specific spatial reference analysis. All, all you have is just the base map aerial image and the wetland polygons. This location here I find interesting. Some of you may be aware this is this is Bay Road. You can see right there and Lubberland Creek comes off the hill down here right into Great Bay. This is the Lamprey River. The Squamscut is nearby as well. Um, not too long ago, a couple years ago, a restoration project was undertaken right here at this crossing over Lubberland Creek. The culvert, the existing culvert had a horrible history of flooding. It was a, a maintenance nightmare for the town and a safety concern. Um, so through a restoration, it was replaced and the design, the culvert that it was replaced with was designed to accommodate not just the modeled flows of yesteryear, but for the projected sea level rise estimates and future flood events. So it's expected that this, the new structure that's in place here today will accommodate salt marsh migration into the areas upstream of the culvert, where previously the tide was restricted by the undersized culvert. So now that that's been replaced and restored, this estuarine limit may migrate upstream. It's, it's expected to as sea level rises. So these palustrine areas will be converted naturally into estuarine systems. And never mind fish passage and eels. Um, this was a really neat project. So that is the National Wetlands Inventory Wetlands Mapper. Let me jump back to my slides as I promised. To would show could you, you um, give us an example of how you might use this if you were reviewing a permit? I'm, I can, yes. So uh, quite honestly, how I would use this data is on the permit planning tool where we have the same NWI data set provided through New Hampshire Granite. And I, I would see the same, same polygons on the permit planning tool. So this is a discrete mapper that's provided by Fish and Wildlife Service only for displaying this specific purpose of, of wetlands. If I was reviewing a permit application, I would be looking at those other features that, that aren't available here, like the parcel boundaries or floodplains or peatlands, uh, that type of thing. So I, I, will, I will show you that when we get to the permit planning tool. Okay, great. Um, but, does this also work if you um, wanna focus in on ponds or lakes instead of just street addresses? Um, it, it may, I'm not sure. We could try, let's see. You know, that, that can be tricky sometimes because the names are not always 
um, you know, is widely known. Right. But, you know, that worked here. I just did Canopy Lake. So probably on the larger water bodies. Okay, great. So yeah, I think if you want to show us the um, mapper. Um, yeah. Um, okay. How are we doing on time? We got about 15 minutes. Yep. Okay. So this real quick is just the, the decoder that I mentioned. So for an E2 system, we would see E for estuarine, 2 for intertidal, and so on. You can use these charts to decipher those codes. So I was going to I'll, I'll skip through this real quick, but just to point out, it, it does exist. It's uh, this historic aerials mapper, and it is another discrete viewer. So its only purpose is to provide layers of historic aerial images, but they date back to the 50s, plus or minus. Um, this mapper was really designed for real estate purposes, but you can imagine from a review standpoint, it's pretty relevant and can be really useful for reviewing properties or features to determine whether they have grandfathered structures or if they were legally constructed prior to permit jurisdiction. So if we see something in a wetland that was put there before 1969, then that gives us a, an image here, some documentation to support that, it, that it's an existing legal structure. Hmm. Um, also, some of the older black and white photos can be used to identify wetland signatures on the landscape. So just another use for a historic aerial image. Uh, that that I did provide Barbara with a link to that one too. So I'm sure you'll all get it. Uh, all right, so finally, I'll jump into the permit planning tool. Um, I have presented on the permit planning tool a couple times to, to a similar audience. So I was going to just focus on some of the recent updates that we've done to the tool and I'll definitely open it up and kind of show you some of the functionality but I wasn't going to dive into a you know detailed description of each layer or anything so the permit planning tool is the first one that I'll mention today that is built within this um, geocortex platform and that doesn't probably mean much to you it, it doesn't really need to, other than the fact that to know that Granite View, One Stop Data Mapper, Coastal Viewer, are, they're all built with this same program, Geocortex. So they have a very similar look and feel and, and fu similar functionality. So I'm going to focus on the permit planning tool because has a common purpose between you know what, what we do in the wetlands bureau what you guys are doing at the Con conservation commissions and it's best suited for that purpose and has so much similarities and overlap with the other ones that i think this is the, the one to focus on so i will pop over there first the disclaimer i probably sound like a broken record by now but it is not intended for legal engineering or surveying purposes, and you have to acknowledge that before you can enter in. Then you will see this home panel on the left hand side of the screen. Down here, you can see the little home icon for that tab, and then the layers tab, you can toggle between those. And then as you open certain tools, you might have more tabs down here too. So this panel is pretty important and you can drag it to make it bigger or smaller. You can also collapse it too. So you might say, oh no, I lost my panel, but you can click and reopen it just like that. So recently our Wetlands Bureau data analyst, Brian Young has been doing a lot of work to put in some updates, make sure everything is functional and working. Um, and he's added some layers. So I selected the layer icon down here to open the layer list. And in the base map group, Brian has added this set of aerial imagery. It's not quite as many layers as you would find on that previous mapper, but it's a, it's a good set to get you started. Uh, you have to turn it on there to be able to drop down this list of 
images. They're all dated um, and we're providing the true color and the color infrared versions. So you may know the color infrared images can be particularly useful for identifying potential wetland areas or at least changes in vegetative communities. Um, I have an image of that here. So this is the color infrared and you can just easily see how the, there's a different change in the vegetative community. So in certain cases, you can use other data to support too, like the, the hill shade topography on the LIDAR and maybe get a, an idea. You know, it, it may suggest one section is wetter than another and, and that may inform or target your field investigation. So the aerial imagery, Brian has also added a group for this elevation and topography. That includes the two foot LIDAR contours and the hillshade contours. He has also updated the NWI data set, which exists in the resource planning layers group, National Wetlands Inventory. So as we know, this is grayed out and italicized because we are zoomed way too far out. We'll have to zoom further in to a pretty close extent to get that to become available. And this is essentially the same data. You know what, I'll even go right back to the same location. And you can see, you know, I guess they are different colors. However, it is the same extent of estuarine wetland polygons here that we're seeing. This is that Lubberland Creek project across Bay Road. So this is really how I use the NWI data set is through the permit planning tool where I can hone right in on say this parcel and get a better idea you know, of the extent of the wetland relative to the parcel boundaries. And then I can use the layer list to overlay other data to inform my technical review. If I shut this NWI layer off, you can see these other features underneath there. And I'll point those out as they are priority resource areas. And you may be familiar with the wetlands rules, which elevate a project's classification and sometimes require mitigation or additional materials to be provided with their application if they are within a priority resource area. So I'm still within this resource planning layers group. And just to point out also that Brian has added the wildlife action plan layers here, which include the prioritized habitat blocks and the some of the corridors data that we were looking at earlier. He has also updated all of the metadata for each layer that we have on here. We have a link to the available metadata. I know that just got messy on the screen, but I just want to point out these arrows next to the layer. You can click on that. And it opens a little menu here for you and has a metadata link. So you can you can click that metadata and get that understanding of when the layer was created, when it was last updated, and who to call if you have any issues with it. So I will close that. And I'm going to collapse these so it's not so hard to look at. And what I wanted to do too with the permit planning tool, rather than, like I said, going layer by layer, is highlight one of the tools that I think is, is pretty functional when we're, we're talking about wetlands permits, at least. So you click on this tools icon, it unfolds your toolbox. And these are all available for you to kind of manipulate the map. You can identify features, measure distances, print maps. This is where we were talking about earlier. You can title the map, you can include the legend, and it publishes a nice formatted map for you of the extent that you're looking at. But I want to show you the query tool. So I'm going to open that. 
it opens over here in the same panel with, with the other information. And I want to query the layer that is the wetlands and shorelands permits. So right here, NHDES wetlands or shoreland permit. These are all the layers in this list that are on the layer list that you could turn on and display. But I'm just going to select this one, wetlands and shorelands permits. And the permit I had selected, so you have to know the permit number. This wouldn't be for like a pre-application review. It has to have a DES file number. I'm going to type in 2014-0-2425. And you, I hit enter, so it executed the query. And these were the results of the query. So I'm just going to select one there. And I'm going to shut that off because I messed it up there. So by querying for that permit number, it took me straight to this point. And you can hardly see, see these red dots? That's what's underneath this little pin. And that's indicating that this wetlands permit, 2014-24-25, was located right here. And you can click on that opens this pop-up window, which you can also click here for a link to the one-stop search, which gives you a description of the, the application or the, the permit file with the file number, some dates, the status, the application status, permit approved. If it was still under technical review, it, that's what it would say, under technical review. And that, you know, may be interesting to you. If you're driving across town and you see this construction going on, you say, hey, do, do they have a wetlands permit? You could look that up by kind of going through similar steps. So I also, in this location, wanted to point out some of the PRAs, and I'm getting really close on time. Um, but in this layer group, I'll collapse resource planning. So we're only looking at priority resource areas. This is providing those areas that would elevate a project review at, at the state level, at least. So we're looking at floodplain wetlands adjacent to a tier three stream. And we also see some peatlands over here. And real quick, the peatlands layer that we're displaying is a clip or a, a carve out of the wildlife action plans habitat types. And truthfully, as a priority resource area, the priority resource area actually identifies bogs, which, as you know, are a type of peatland. So not all peatlands are bogs. Therefore, this layer, this is a, a great example of how this is really just for screening purposes. We would see this and say, you know, uh oh, there's a potential peatland in this area we'll have to look a little closer to determine if it's a bog or not, and then the review process may change. So I'm going to skip back to my slides real quick. Um, I didn't really get into sh displaying the LIDAR or the hillshade. Uh, if I may, I'll try and do that real quick. Those exist again under the base maps groups. Elevation and topography, you'll find the two foot contours layer. It's going to take a second to load. I'll also show you where the stream tiers are. So, this is giving us two foot contours derived from the LIDAR data set. And then also from the same data, but displayed differently, is the hill shade. And these, these two together individually, they're so powerful to really give you a very detailed look at the shape of the landscape that can help you identify uh, drainage paths that may not be you know, readily presented on a plan or in an aerial image. Um, it can give you that picture to kind of identify at least changes in habitat structure or community type. And uh, you know, hydrologic connections. So if there's, you can see this shaded feature here, something's going on here that's draining right into the mascoma. So pretty powerful stuff. If I close that, 
I want to point out here, Shoreland jurisdiction. We're still under the base maps layer group. If I unfold that and drop down this rivers and streams, these are rivers and streams that are subject to the protected shoreland or the Shoreland Protection Act. And these numbers are actually indicating the stream order. So we're only showing four and greater because that's what's relevant to the Shoreland Act. Uh, but you can find the rest of this data set through New Hampshire Granite and get a, a visual sense for, for the lower stream orders. That's amazing information to have at your fingertips. So thank you so much for, for covering yeah. that. Um, I'm not sure we'll have time to do the, the um, one stop, but it was great to see that you can get there through um, the wetlands permit mapper tool. Yeah, and you guys will have these slides. I wasn't even going to do a full demonstration of one stop because it's so similar, the format, the layer list. There are some layers on one stop that are secured layers that we can't display publicly, but you can um, request at least uh, authorized credentials to, to access those. Um, and then similar to Granite View, same format. Granite View has all of the layers that are available from the statewide clearinghouse. So you can imagine just the range of, of end users that could leverage that. Um, and I provided this link too. I think it'll get to you through Barbara, but on our DES homepage, you can use this resource center if you go there and then here, data and mapping. That takes you to our DES page that has links to almost all of the viewers that I showed today, plus several others. So I would encourage you to go there and explore that also. Yep. Yeah. And I, and again, I'm going to be including a lot of the links. Um, in today's program in the follow-up email that I'll be sending out tomorrow. Um, and that will include um, Stephanie's contact information as well. If you have any questions directly for her, you can reach out. Um, so again, yeah, it's amazing amount of information right at your fingertips. So it's very helpful if you are um, reviewing permits or for your um, natural resource inventory, um, there's a lot you can do. Um, so again, thank you so much, Stephanie. It was great to have um, have you cover all of that information. If you were to start with one mapper program, which one would you recommend? I'm to partial to the permit planning tool just yep. because it, it has all that information, a lot of it overlapping with the others, and it's it's tailored, it's designed to what we are doing right. in terms of wetlands and preservation and and all that as resource managers so that that'd be my favorite yep i would agree <laughs> i think that's a good place to start so we'll let you we'll again include those links um i just want to give a quick um heads up that the next program des rules and how the permit process works will be friday march 31st and then the um in classroom Wetlands Assessment Program will be April 14th. Um, again, I'll be sending the registration um, links as well um, in that follow-up email. So, um, and I'll, uh, the priority programs, um, the in-person programs uh, are coming up as well. And the good news for everybody who's attended at least two of these Zoom programs, you will be given priority registration for those in-person programs happening in May and June. So, um, oh, and I also want to let everybody know the first two sessions are now on our YouTube channel, so we will be able to access, um, you'll, you'll be able to share and continually access these uh, wetland training programs as you need them. And um, again, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, New Hampshire DES, for all that you do and for, um, for the um, the work that you're doing out there um, protecting our wetlands. And Sandy Crystal, who's who's been presenting these programs, wanted me to remind you that the first wetland assessment is being done on Zoom. There's a pre, you know, before the field site visit, we'll be doing a, a Zoom program. And again, that one is April 14th. And then in May, we're going out in the field. So everybody um, have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And um, 
if you have any trouble with the links or anything, just let me know, um, send me that email and I'll follow up with more specifics. Thank you all, have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. You. Bye-bye.